The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. I think uh, many of you know uh, George Dago did go home to be with the Lord, and I just uh, rejoice in the way that you guys loved him and helped him to the very end to breathe his last holding to Jesus Christ, uh, now being rewarded beyond what we could hope or think. 2020, may God do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that mightily works within us. This morning, I've been asked by the elders to give a New Year's message on something very important to the leadership that we've been studying out and giving much prayer and time to. I've been studying it for the last 20 years, really, in the Word of God, experientially, and shepherding the church, our membership in it. And I'm just blessed to get to share with you this morning what God has taught me and my personal journey. First, I wanted to pray and thank God for His bountiful mercies upon us for this last year in 2019. As no surprise, we saw the faithfulness of God in many, many different ways. It was a challenging year for many, um, very difficult years. And I watched God do mighty things in our midst. It seemed like the the hotter the furnace, I just watched more and more of Christ come out of so many of you uh, in your trials and that is it. We're a colony of heaven, and our hope is past this, and we're helping each other to continue to look and set our our hope on where it should be. So I just never cease to be amazed at how God works everything together uh, for his good. I, I watched a young man stand at his father's funeral and just proclaim the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ to many unbelievers sitting in his in their midst. So we start the new year 2020, some of the strongest unity we've had since our inception. I've never seen our body loving and working together more for His glory and in a more cohesive way. What I watched with George was people who were giving up their lives and nights and sleeping and staying there and and doing doing. One man said before the service, "I I helped change him. I, I, I he just found sacrificial love and what God's doing." and his heart, and it was just a body that came alongside this brother who was saved in our prison ministry, and just all that was done, just there was the aroma of Jesus Christ, and I'm so grateful, and I've watched us do some funerals here, and some weddings, and just the way everybody's jumping in, and serving, and and, and sacrificing, uh, the testimonies at the prayer and praise uh, just again and again of how the body of Christ came alongside us in our suffering and in our needs and helped us journey through it. I sat with my brother Mike uh, on Christmas and he's going through dialysis and he just said it's been unbelievable to, to have the saints come and pick me up and drive me. And, and it's, you know, one week it's, it's someone that I, I never even knew and we had the sweetest fellowship we could have ever had. And then the next time it was a, a teenager and the fellowship and, and it's just been unbelievable, he said, to sit and experience the body of Christ. And when he comes in there, they're like, who brought you today? All the nurses and everybody want to know. Like, I've never known a church that does this. So they, they can't wait to see who brings them each week. And he gets to keep telling them the gospel and the beauties of Christ. It's just been so beautiful for me as a shepherd to watch, because I've always believed if you behold Jesus Christ, you will become like him. And for me to watch and see uh, what he is doing has been, been good. And God is getting much glory. And, and by the way, you're suffering. And so what I would like to do before we shift our focus then this morning to 2020 is it, it's right to give God thanks that he still holds us here this morning loving Christ is all of his grace, and, and we should just stop and give him thanks. And so let's do that as a congregation. Father, we look back and we see nothing but the hand of faithfulness. God, our years, last year, 2019, it just wasn't what we planned. It wasn't what we thought. And yet your perfect will was done in each one of our lives. And it's that will that is, uh, desires to conform us to the image of Christ And you brought exactly what each life needed in that journey. And so God, for for that, we want to give you thanks. And we thank you that we have a lampstand in our midst, that Jesus Christ is here in our midst. 
and he is doing his work. And so God, thank you that you would love Southside Bible Church in this way. And so Lord, as we look back, we just want to praise and thank you for all the ways that you are faithful to us. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Okay. I'm hoping only to use that Kleenex once today. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at the church then. And the church in the Greek word is ekklosia. And it comes from two words, kaleo, to, to call. And ek is out of. So we're, we're called out of the world into this place called uh, the church, the salvation. We're, we're brought into Christ and we're brought into his salvation. And now we're, as Ray talked about this morning, there's a cornerstone with living stones being built up into this beautiful temple. And so we are God's called out ones who, who gather together separate from this world to worship our God for the grace that he's bestowed upon each and every one of us. So that, that's the church of God. It, it's not a building. It's the called out ones with the spirit of God and in, in filling them and working out the commission that Christ has left to us. So I wanted to begin with kind of a broad brush swoop of redemptive history to understand what we're looking at this morning. <clears throat> I wanted you to see that the church was in the mind and the heart and the purpose of God before the foundation of the world. He didn't come up with this later. This is before he ever acted or did anything in history. Ephesians 1, 4, he chose us before the foundation of the world that we, the church, should be holy and blameless. Jesus being the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So we see this picture of the church in seed form, I've talked about it many times in Genesis 3, that, that God promised after the fall that he's going to come and crush the serpent's head by a seed from Adam. And after that promise, we, we, because there was, a, there was a fall, they were tempted. Adam and Eve were tempted by the evil one, and they, they bit, they ate from the tree, and they took all of us into death and separation from God. It brought great destruction into the whole cosmos. It's all at enmity now against it. And then Genesis 3, God does make a promise to restore us through the seed of Adam. And then we watch in Genesis the spread of mankind's sinfulness. You just start reading and you're overwhelmed with what starts coming out because of the fall and what God's created ones are now doing against each other. And it ends in a, a universal judgment where God floods the whole earth. And then he gives a rainbow as a promise to never flood the earth again. And what I love about that, I love the Noahic covenant, is, is it's a promise that he's going to fulfill that Genesis promise to bring a, a restoration through his seed. So I love the rainbow because it, it promises that God's going to finish his work of redemption and what he's doing right now in Jesus Christ. Look at a rainbow and worship because it, it's, it's promising you he will fulfill this, this outworking of the new covenant and his ultimate end and goal in history. Well, our story progresses. God calls out Abraham, and he begins his work then of this promise through him. And he promises Abraham, among many other things, <clears throat> that he will make a great nation from him, Israel. And the Jewish nation begins, and it, it grows, and it grows. And, and to be a membership of that, you had to be born of natural descent, and you had to be circumcised, the sign of the people of God, and they were brought into it. They were to be a, Israel was to be a son of God to show the world a manifestation of God and his people. And he gave them laws to make them different from the fallen world around them. They weren't to commingle with, with those around them. They were to be holy and be separate and not be conformed to this world. <clears throat> they were to worship God and God alone. And, and they failed miserably. They had the law, but they had fallen hearts. And the law could not fix the problem. The nation, for the most part, was apostate. They had external worship, but God says, your hearts are far away from me. They didn't have the work of God in their hearts except for the elect, which in Romans 9 through 11, in a few years when we get to it, we'll see that that is indeed what God was doing. But in the fullness of the time, Christ Jesus was born into the world and he came and he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it in its righteous requirements and he fulfilled it by, by the consequences of breaking the law. He became a transgressor in our place and there he bore the wrath of God for the justice of breaking his law. He crushed the serpent's head on the cross and he won the victory. 
And that he now gives to any who will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be saved and brought up into this salvation. And Jesus said, he said, I must leave so that I can send the Holy Spirit so that you can do greater works than these. I, that verse always amazes me. In Acts 2, we're told that Joel 2 was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon those gathered from many nations. And they repented and believed in Jesus Christ and thousands were added to the church that day. And so what I want you to see is this is so climactic in redemptive history and where it's been moving is, is the church, the ecclesia, God's fulfillment, the, the ones in, in Ephesians 1 who were chosen and Christ died for and the Spirit regenerated and gave the gift of faith to these ones. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians, this is so climactic, the church of God. And so these ones, these glorious ones who have been redeemed, I want you to look with me now in verse 18 of chapter 1. Paul lays out this glorious salvation, and now he bows his knee and he prays. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, he will put all things in subjection under his feet, Christ, and he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Here is the redemptive, beautiful, climactic work of God moving then now to, to the fullness of the church. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he tells us of this grace that while we were dead in transgressions and sins, God made us alive together with Christ and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. And so he's prepared these works for the church of God that was predestined before the foundation of the world to now put them on display to show the world the, the beauty, what, what Israel never did and failed, the church is going to do now through the power of the Spirit working in us, being united to Jesus Christ. We're going to now have works that are going to show forth children of God and who God is. What a, what a beautiful moment to move from ex external and circumcision to the circumcision of the heart with everyone now being a regenerate believer and, and able to put on display the glory and the beauty of God. Under the old covenant, worship, the Gentiles had to stay out. <clears throat> the Jews could go a little further in, but only one, one time a year could go into the Holy of Holies and make that sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. And so there was such a division between the Jews and the Gentiles in worship. And now what we're told in this climactic moment, the church, that the enmity between these two has been taken away in Christ by his crucifixion. The wall that separates them falls. And now we're one new man in Jesus Christ. And I just want to read it to you. Look with me in verse 14, chapter 2. <coughs> For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. He made both groups, Jew and Gentiles, into one. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. How? By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, draining it on a cross, draining the enmity of God towards us and our enmity toward one another now in this gospel, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances that in himself, Jesus, he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace, peace with God and peace with us now 
in Christ. So he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity, enmity, drained, gone. He came and he preached peace to you who are far away and peace to you who are near, Jews and Gentiles. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You're all the household of God now with one spirit, fellow citizens together, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone and whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. There's the climax in history, and we're a part of this. And now this glorious building that God is building on Jesus Christ and all the enmity between Jew and Gentile is taken away in Christ. And now with the same Spirit in Christ and oneness, where there's just the enmity is gone and there's peace between us. Now listen to this. What do we do with that unity that God has now brought about? If if there is any enmity between you and anyone sitting in this room, then you've broken down the whole gospel. As now we come from all walks of life. We have a lot of different cultures even represented here this morning. And it's it's all been broken down in, in Christ to just be this one body of Christ. And there's a reason. It's not just so we can smile and everybody gets along. There's something bigger for why God has done something this amazing. And I want you to just pay attention now to Ephesians 3.1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, uh, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, what is that thing that's been a mystery and he's making known? That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. How? Through the gospel, what Christ has done. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ, and that now they can come into the promise of being made one with God and having relationship with him. I, Paul, I get, to, I get to preach that to the Gentiles. And I can bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created everything so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. So the, the manifold wisdom of God now can be put on display. How? Through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. And so what I want you to see then is that we are the manifold wisdom of God. We are to, to, to show the world this beautiful wisdom of God of how he brought Jew and Gentiles to break down the enmity and the separation and how to bring us into oneness, into oneness with God. And this whole beautiful, amazing, wise plan that God has come up with is what the church now is to show forth to the world, in the heavenly places and in this world, is is people should look at us and say, the wisdom of God. How could anyone, the world just keeps trying to get unity and oneness, and it never gets it. And someone could come in here this morning, and, and we're to be the ones who show the wisdom of God. And they, they get a look and say, how could you ever get so many different people unified and loving one another and loving God and pulling the same direction and running after the same thing, the glory of God? How, how can that happen? That's the manifold wisdom of God called the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And this is so amazing. Will you look with me in uh, Ephesians 3.21? The church then is to him, God, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God's glory. The church is the theater then of God's glory. We're, we're where you're going to see God's glory. It's going to be put on display here in the church. So Paul's saying his plan and his mystery that's been hidden for ages is now being made known in this day and age in the church to show forth the manifold wisdom of God and his plan and program and what he's doing in the gospel. One preacher said, the reason God created the world and called the church into being is so that he would have a sufficiently diversified yet unified system of mirrors with which to reflect the glory of his many-sided wisdom to the universe. He, every one of you are a mirror to show the manifold wisdom of God, to shine his glory into the world. So we are a local expression of that Southside Bible Church. Our goal is to be a visible and audible doxology to God. Our, our chief end of why we exist in Southside is here, is we want to just be a sermon. We want people to see the glory of God by looking at his power and what he's doing in our midst. That's our chief end. That's what we're shooting at. And he wants it to be done, he says, and in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of this wisdom of God. He's the main character of the drama played out in the theater of the local church. Ray read it. (laughs) We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. The church is the place where the work of Christ is to take effect and manifest its power to the ends of the earth. This is where it should take effect in regeneration and salvation and sanctifying and growing us and that it would shine and go forth to the ends of the very earth. These are great and grand things that we're looking at this morning. Don't look so bored. What's wrong with you? Some of you look like you're sitting on pins. Goodness, the church is something amazing. And listen to what Paul, it makes him erupt into a doxology, and it just hit me this week. Why? Well, look at verse 20. (laughs) Why, Paul? Now to him who is able, Christ, to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. And then look at verse 18. He prays that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. And so I want you to hear this. The love of God for the church, it surpasses knowledge. You can't measure it. There's a breadth and a height and a depth and a length to it that no one can comprehend it goes beyond what you know. The, the, the deepest love you know of Christ this morning that you comprehend is so far short of how deep and the reality of what it really is. And then he says, the power of God for the church, uh, what you know of it goes beyond what you could ever ask or think. That there's more love than you could ever comprehend and there's more power to the church than you could ever fathom or understand. <laughs> when God's great love with which he loved us, meets with his power, there's more than we could ever ask or think. And it produces glory to God, which is our chief end. Don't ever, I just feel like there's so much more we can do for his name's sake. Because of the, the love with which he's loved us and the power that is available to us in Christ Jesus. To, to glorify God with our, our lives individually and corporately, there's so much more that can be done because of it, to put God on display. Do you see the beauty of the church of God? It was planned and purposed before the foundation of the world. It's a mystery that was hidden. And now in these end days was made manifest to show forth the manifold wisdom of God. 
the head of the church, came to this earth and he died on a cross for us because of his love. And now he gives us his power. He is the focus of the church. He's our supreme love and our supreme proclamation. All of grace that comes to us is glory emanating through the whole world of this Christ who saves. The way the world will see God is through us. We're mirrors of this glory. Membership to the ecclesia, to those who have been called by God in Ephesians 1 through 3, is amazing. And, and what I love is every member is regenerate in the true church of God. So we have what's called an invisible church. That's everyone who shows up on a Sunday in all the churches. But the vis- that's the visible church, sorry. The invisible church is those who have been regenerated. And so Israel, most of them were unregenerate and they were still circumcised. But we've been circumcised of heart and we've been made new and, and there's a power in the church of God that's unbelievable with those who have been born from above. So that now we can be true sons and daughters of God. And we can do what Israel failed to do. And we can show forth the beauty and the character of a saving God in our day-to-day lives. We have new hearts. The fulfillment and the, the beauty of the church of God. I pray that you love the church of God and God's design. Israel had the Shekinah glory that, that would lead them and guide them in the wilderness. And, and we have it housed in us. We have the glory of glories dwelling within us this morning, every child of God. And we are led by the Spirit of God from within. This is no small matter. Listen to Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I pray, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, (coughs) that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints Again, what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth? Isn't that beautiful, (laughs) what God has done? I was asked this morning to show specifics then of how it functions, but I just wanted you to worship this morning and see the fulfillment and the fullness of what God has designed in the church of God. And so I'm going to look at practically now, how does this work day to day in a local assembly how God has designed to use it for our good and for his glory and for us to be mirrors into this world. And so the passage selected was Ephesians 4. I preached on this right before my sabbatical. Does anyone remember? I started thinking, you poor guys got to hear some of the same things, but then I remembered I don't even remember half of them. So I bet no one in here remembers. You come tell me afterwards if you did, I'll be happy. (laughs) So I want to look at it in light of of, of what we're considering with church membership. So it's a different angle, but I'm, I'm going to use a similar, the same outline. So the outline I gave you before we left in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 was seven principles to put on display the manifold wisdom of God and our unity together. And so the, the first point I'd like to go over then is the context for unity, and that's Ephesians 1 through 3, and that is what I just shared is the Ephesians, this redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the good works that God's prepared for us to walk in so that we could show the manifold wisdom of God. That's what the church is and that's what we function and it is all for the glory of God. Second, the call then to preserve the unity of the Spirit, uh, Ephesians 4.3. <clears throat> Paul says now, be therefore, in verse 1, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so I want you to get this. Do you see what God did to create our unity in Ephesians 1 through 3? It cost him his own son. All of history has been painting and preparing for his son to come on a cross and redeem a people for himself. This unity came at the greatest price and cost you could possibly give. And God wants us to treasure it. He wants us to treat it as important as it really is. His glory is at stake. To not make my issues, my hurts, my little slanders and gossips bigger than his glory. Bigger. Since I preach this, <laughs> I, I've, I've watched some of you hear that and get hurt and say, my hurt's bigger than the unity of the Spirit. And I'm just, 
begging you to look at this this morning and see what unity means to God and what he's purchased to not let our stuff get bigger than that. That's why he says, be diligent. It's hard. Fight for it. Don't uh, preserve it. Don't create it. It's already there. This is done. We have it if we're joined to Christ. We have amazing unity. And so I'm asking you, please don't grieve your pastor and more importantly, the Spirit to say, I just don't connect with anyone. No one likes sports the way I do. (laughs) I like to go to bars and no one here does. Christ plus nothing is our unity. And if you don't have unity with people who love Jesus Christ, you don't understand the beginnings of the gospel. And if you don't, I, I need you this morning to really do soul surgery. Why don't you love the body of Christ? People who love Christ, you can come from all different walks of life and we're one and we love each other. And when I hear that you need natural things to bring about that unity, I just say, that's garbage. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelief and it's flesh. It's the world's system. It's not God's. If there's anything that you need to bring unity with anyone but faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel, we've missed it. This is Paul's first command. He's going to take 16 verses to flush it out. And I told you this before, it's more than the amount of time on marriage, parenting, spiritual warfare, and our fight for purity. God's most important issue, the longest that he addresses, is our diligence to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Why? Because of what I just told you. It's so big. He doesn't want us to diminish his glory and and break it up fighting with one another and stupid things like that. This is the first and foremost matter of our sanctification in Ephesians and as well in Romans 12. This falls way too lightly on the church of God today. This is the passion and the will of God. There's so much at stake in the preservation of this so that the church functions and works and proclaims to the world the way that God has designed it to work. This is big. When someone thinks of growing in holiness, this one never makes the books or the seminary classes. I've never found one but it makes God's and it makes Paul's chief concern. This is so important in God's program. It cannot be a side note to you or or we're not walking in the spirit. This has to be a priority and a primary focus of the children of God. This is what Jesus said he will do. I will build my church and the gates of hell won't overcome it. This is how the new covenant will be worked out and will shine forth my glory to this world, the ecclesia. But we will never be all that God designed for us to be. <clears throat> we must preserve the unity despite all of our differences. Remember Romans 14 that I preached. We, we dwell together as one with our love for God and each other. To live into what we already are. Do you see each member of the body of Christ in this way? It's so crucial. And so my question to you this morning, why wouldn't somebody want unity? Unity. Why would anybody break this? If that's God's design and his purpose and his beauty, why in the world would anyone ever break this? My answer is because the devil hates this unity. Because he hates the church. What's the church designed to do? Give glory to God. So he, he hates it. He's going to always be trying to destroy it all of his days until he's just finished and thrown in the abyss for eternity. So my third point. There are barriers then to unity. I wish it was just easy. (laughs) He wouldn't say be diligent if it was easy. So third point, barriers to unity. The answer is quite simple. There's something bigger in my heart than this unity. What do you guys think that could possibly be? You can yell it out if you want. (laughs) What's going to get in the way of, of unity is a little epithumia, right? I know I, I'm hung up on that word. I will be till I die because it's just it's so rich. And it's thumia. For anyone new, it's a desire. Epi is an over-desire. And it's these over-desires for good things, bad things, anything you want to put in the head of Jesus Christ. And so it could be something really good that's bothering you. It could be something the church is doing wrong that I wish they did better or right. It, there could be so many things but it becomes an epithumia when it means more to me than the glory of Christ. 
It means more to me than the unity being mirrors showing everybody in the world this gospel and who Jesus is. But my little offense now, it's become bigger than what I just went over in Ephesians 1 through 4. And you're going to stand before God and say, but I was right. <laughs> Come on. Sorry. James says there's quarrels and conflicts among you. Why? Because of your epithemias. You fight in marriages. <laughs> you quarrel because of your epithemias. I want something more than God's beauty and glory and unity. That's our battles. Someone hurt you and it just grows until it's bigger than the unity. And I've got to slander them or make sure that others think less of them. I have to make sure that they know I'm right. I'm not getting what I want. My gifts just aren't being used the way they should. I feel dry. It's easier to blame someone else than just admitting that you've lost your first love. Now, I'll tell you this, when people are growing in Christ and you're not in the same local assembly, you got you to go own it, okay? I own it when I do, okay? It's me. It's not your guys' fault because there's other people growing in Christ. There's something with me I got to go deal with. And so I would just get that. <laughs> oh, Working through difficulties is a lost art. My own agenda, or as, as the writer of Hebrews said, a root of bitterness can spring up and defile many people, people you once loved. And so my question is, how do I do this with so many immature people, people who hurt me, people I don't like the way they smell, I don't like the way they talk, I don't like how they act. What do you do? Fourth point, the remedies to unity. And I'm going to move quickly now, guys. I don't know how to move quickly, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Therefore, I love, oh, I'm going to self-control. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, the church of God with which you've been called. How do we walk worthy? Humility gentleness, and patience, showing tolerance or forbearance for one another in love. Until we show forbearance and love and humility and not make it all about me, but about Christ, we'll, we'll break the unity of the Spirit. There's, there's only one way to do that, and it's, it's through these, these ways. These are remedies for our unity when it comes is how to show love and forgiveness and humility because of all that God has shown to me. That's what I'm going to beg you to fight for. If you're sitting here hurt on the outside, rejected, whatever it is, make the unity of the Spirit bigger and deal with it beautifully before God. Five, fifth point. The way to unity is that we're one. And I've preached this so many times, I'll be quick. Verse four, here's how you get unity. There's one body, the body of Christ. And there's one spirit dwelling in all of us. Just as you were called from darkness into light and one hope. We all have this hope of this coming glory of God and the face of Christ for all of eternity. That's what all of us have as our hope. And we have one Lord. We all just want to submit to this Christ in every bit of our life. We want to help each other with that. We got one faith and one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. So there, I just, there's nothing that could be more unifying than the fact that we all love this sweet Christ and have one Lord and one hope. Isn't that enough to join differences of how you're raised and culture and likes and dislikes, blue collar, white collar? If that isn't enough, you don't understand the gospel. And so I, I just pray that you would see that in all of its beauty this morning. Well, how can you help each other? How can we help each other? The world has tried it for thousands of years and they, they just have not found true unity. We've, we have never worked together to make the world a better place. Okay, it just hasn't happened. So how do we do it? My sixth point is the fruit of unity is verse seven. <clears throat> but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Every one of you have been given a grace gift from Christ for the good of the body of Christ. Believe this, it's not given for the good of you, okay? Do you want to use your gift for you? 
or for the good of this body that you love. And so he's given every one of you a gift that you cannot hide under a bushel. You can't put it in the ground and dig and hide it. Every one of you have a grace gift from God for the body of Christ. And you've been given a role that you would play in the growing of a body up into its head. And so all of us using these gifts and, and, and engaging in life and one another, is, it's going to produce the beautiful fruit of what I see it producing in our very midst. When your gift, I'm sorry, um, just, for, just for now, I want you to see how God has equipped his body, perfectly designed gifts from God that are needed for all of us to grow up into the head. That's a big deal, and it matters if we use them. And I've, I've just been begging, just so many of you are doing a great job in this, and, and then there's others that no matter what I say or do, you just, and as a pastor, it's not so that you'll be serving I, I want you to love Christ and I want you to stand before him on the last day having been faithful with the gift that he gave you. That's my great burden or concern. I'm not looking for free work, okay? I want people who love Christ and take the gift that he gave and just keep finding ways to love the body, the body of Christ. Get in. Use those gifts and love each other. You're, you'll give an account for how you use them. So what is the purpose for ministering to one another? Look at verse 11. <clears throat> I'm just going way too long. He gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service. This teaching the word of God to equip the saints to, to serve so that the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we want to grow into the fullness of Christ. Everything done in the church is for spiritual maturity. That as we get in and do these things, we're going to grow up into the head. We're all given uh, this project with each other. And so I want you to grow in Christ. I want all of us to grow in Christ. We need each other. We need the church to not stay babies. We will stay babies all of our lives if we don't get in the body of Christ and let it do what God's designed it to do. Lone rangers are babies. <laughs> it's here that we grow up. It's those who hold themselves outside of this community, the body of Christ, that do not grow. You stay in your sins and your whole lives. Get in. And when it starts to hurt and people see your sins and you see theirs, stay and face it and grow together. Mine are popping out all the time. <laughs> Help me. We need each other. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Not so I, everybody can see how good I am. <laughs> so you can see how bad I am and help me. Okay, quit putting on a front. You're, you're breaking down the whole thing of the body of Christ. Here it is. Let's get in and love and help and grow each other and build each other up in Christ. The church is designed so that we will grow. Are you growing? The way you grow is not alone. Like you've got to get in the secret place. I'll never tell you to quit doing that. But the design of the church is in community. Deep involvement and depth of relationship with vulnerability. <clears throat> the devil's message will always be stay home, isolate, nurse your hurts, don't deal with them. That will never give God glory that he has designed for the church. That's the devil's lie. And I'm going to say something in love, so put your seatbelts on. But I just love you too much not to say it. I don't fit in. I can't make friends. I have no community. You have to get this. God did everything necessary for us to be built up into our head. The walls have come down. The walls are down. They have to, in our hearts, to not sit in judgment of those in the church because God accepts them. To lock shields with people that you would have never, ever linked up when you were in Adam. You have, I've always said it, I pray if the Holy Spirit was not here this morning that we would hate each other because we're so different. But when he's here, we are one and unified. He indwells us. We have Christ and the work of salvation in common. The difference will actually strengthen and transform us with all of our differences. The world, the world has to have similarities. 
They're drawn by common interest and likes. We are drawn by a common Savior. Is that true of your heart? Have the walls fallen down like the walls of Jericho in your heart as you look at the Christ crucified for you? Or do you walk in here and say, who's going to minister to me? How are people going to treat me? Or do you come in here full of Christ, ready to give yourself away for the body of Christ? To worship God and to love others. If hurting and in need to be vulnerable and to ask for prayer or help. Only the gospel can create this. And only the gospel can take fear away to truly engage with brothers and sisters in Christ. Just going to community groups is not the end goal, but to grow and to have openness and love with those in, in, in my body. So what will it look like? Verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And verse 16, my seventh point is the result of unity will be this. <clears throat> From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, that's all participle phrases, that the body causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself and love. And so I don't know what more to say is the, the way the body grows it is by the body. And the way we're going to grow is by engaging in this body with each other's gifts and, and the, the way my whole body working together, the glands and the organs and, and tissue and all these things work together for us to grow. In the, in the church, it, it's all of our gifts, all of us engaging, and the body is going to cause the growth of the body. The way you're going to grow is by locking shields and loving and serving this body and being open and vulnerable. It's God's design in the church. So application. Yeah, it's a little too clear. Don't you feel like the first Sunday in the new year you should stay in church longer than normal? <laughs> I do. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy 2020. Hallelujah. <laughs> the application is too clear, and you know it. Church membership. Jesus gave his life to give life to the church. He's the head. He is building his church. He's preparing her for an ultimate wedding and consummation when he returns. He's washing her with the word that he, he would not, we wouldn't have any spot or wrinkle, but that we would be holy and blameless when we're given to him on the last day as a bride. This is God's program. A unified, regenerate membership in the body of Christ. One faith in him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, all walls broken down, joining hands to make much of our Father through His Son. That's our unity. And this is how we're going to grow. This is how the world will get evangelized with missions. This is how we're going to persevere. We're going to be overseen and watched over. We're going to one another each other. This is how we're going to become like Christ. This is how God's going to be glorified in His world. We'll be mirrors just shining this is where the great commission will take place. I am always with you to make disciples. This is where the power of Christ is more than we could ask or think for this task. That power he's giving to the church. The beauty of a bride. We cannot insult God and use it when we feel like it. Do you hear that? That is an insult to God. The, the church is just something, if I feel like it, if the mountains aren't calling me that morning, or, you know, I just sit home and watch it on a camera. Goodness. That's, that's, that's a mockery of what I've just gone over this morning. See, the writer of Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling together, as is the habit of some, as the days are drawing near. And the next verse is the, the verse of apostasy in Hebrews 10, 26. This is the place where we, we keep each other on the track. Of the, the, to the finish line, to Christ. It's not, I'm going to keep my options open. To walk away when you never exercise humility, forbearance, or forgiveness. To withhold our grace gifts from those that they were given for. To criticize and mock it and go from church to church till you find its first weakness and you just keep leaving. You'll never grow doing that. This bride demanded the blood of Christ. 
to purchase it? And are we going to give them a 10 cent response? <laughs> oh, here you go. Here's my little leftovers. I'll give you my 10 cents for your billion dollar sacrifice. Give yourself to the bride of Christ. God's given us elders and deacons. He's given us preaching and teaching on Jesus Christ. Discipleship and mentoring. Fellowship and hospitality. Small groups. He's given spiritual gifts. He's given us baptisms and communion. Worship and one anothering and church discipline if you stray and wander from the faith in Jesus Christ. It's the fullness of the times, the body of Christ. It's a saved, regenerate membership now spreading the message of Christ through the world, through the church. And we're going to spend the next three weeks looking then at what it means to be a member of this local body here at Southside Bible Church and how we'll work it out here in this local assembly. And I promise you this, we will never lord this over you. <laughs> that just isn't the way the Bible does it. Okay, so we won't. It's a gracious, joyful thing. Like the, the happiest thing I have is to give myself to the body of Christ. Like it just, it, if it's coerced, it's wrong. Therefore, offer up your body as a living sacrifice. You look at this and you say, I give myself to his bride. So it's not going to be a sermon every week. I was in a church every week. There was a sermon about baptism at the end. Okay, That's not what we're going to do. But we just desire to make clear to you what the Bible teaches about membership then in his local body. And I want you to see all of its beauty and how it will work out in practice here at Southside. And so we're going to start from scratch. <coughs> Everyone is going to need to join again because it's been so disjointed. And so there's no backing in. You know, if you stay here long enough, you, you back in as a member, that isn't going to be it. This is a joyful, willing decision to say, I want to get into this local assembly and give my life and my gifts to it, my sacrifice. That's, that's what God's calling for. And it should be like Acts where 5,000 were added that day. I'm praying for 400 at the end of this study. Okay, that's a joke. That's, that's bad. But we're going to explain how we will maintain membership as we continue should the Lord tarry. And so I pray for the glory of the church and belonging to a local expression of it is my great joy. And I want us to join together to make much of Christ with the days that he grants us here on this earth. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beauty and the glory of what we just looked at. And I thank you for this climactic season that we live in, in the ecclesia. I thank you that the mystery that was hidden in times gone by, that now it's been made known. I thank you that it, it has broken down a wall of enmity between Jew and Gentile. I thank you now that in Christ we are made one and it breaks down every kind of enmity that anything could be created. Lord, I pray that there would be no enmity with anyone sitting in this room because of the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God, it brings peace in the body. And we have one Lord and one faith, one hope and one baptism. Oh God, I, I pray that we would see the beauty of this and we would give our lives to what you've designed and that you would use it for the building up of us in Christ, and that we truly would be a bunch of mirrors showing the manifold wisdom of God to the heavenly places and to this world. God, I pray that we would be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. God, I thank you for this uh, time together. And now as we, we have communion together, I, I pray what could be a better way uh, to consider uh, for the close of what we've looked at than the one who uh, had his body broken and his blood spilled out to purchase this bride and to, to give us this eternal salvation. God, I thank you, and it's in his name that we do pray. 
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.